Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's RPO Leadership Forum, The True Financial Impact of Unfilled Jobs. This is Lamise Aburama with the Recruitment Process Outsourcing Association and host of the RPO Leadership Forum. If this is your first time on our program, welcome for our returning audience. Welcome back. We're excited you could join us and hope you'll enjoy the event. The webinar is being recorded. You'll receive the recording within 24 hours. We encourage you to ask questions during the webinar using the Q&A function. With the conclusion of the housekeeping announcements, it is my pleasure and honor to welcome two returning speakers to the RPO Leadership Forum. Pam Verhoff, president of Advanced RPO, is an accomplished executive leader with over 20 years of experience in recruitment process outsourcing and talent acquisition. She is a recognized leader in the industry, achieving many awards, including HRO Today, Superstar, SIA's Global Power 150 Women in Staffing, and RPOA's Influential Women in RPO. In addition, her demonstrated leadership has contributed to company recognition, including clearly rated Best of RPO Award for Service Excellence with a Net Promoter Score 15 times higher than the industry average, a 95% hiring manager and candidate satisfaction in client companies, and a Glassdoor approval rating of 100%. Her success has largely been a result of building high performance teams and creating a value-driven culture, resulting in exceptional employee engagement. This is Pam's ninth speaking engagement with the RPOA since Advanced RPO joined the association in 2017. Pam also serves on the RPO Association Advisory Board and is an active contributor to our content, programs, and our business strategy. We're very fortunate and proud to have both Pam and her advanced team as part of our great organization. Welcome, Pam. Thank you. Secondly, I would like to welcome John Hess, Executive Vice President of Operations with Advanced RPO. John is an innovator who brings experience as a corporate talent acquisition leader and as an operational leader in the RPO industry. John is responsible for operational strategy, solution design, service delivery, and customer experience at Advanced RPO and has designed, implemented, and managed recruitment strategy and processes for many Fortune 1000 companies. His role at Advanced RPO also involves employee development, mentorship, and spearheading change management initiatives. This is John's fourth time on the RPO Leadership Forum. Welcome, John. Thank you. I have a little ways to catch Pam, so she yeah. just died. <laughs> this is say, man, that was my that was my dose of confidence for the day. I'm done, right? <laughs> Thank you, Lamise. That was uh, it's it's an honor, and um, certainly John and I and the rest of our team are very committed to um, moving the RPOA forward, which is why we enjoy having these discussions. So um, today, we don't have a lot of time today, but we want to talk about the importance of viewing talent acquisition really is an investment, but through the lens of vacancies. We know it's really difficult as a practitioner um, for many organizations to really get at this topic. So we're gonna provide a, a different perspective that we hope will resonate with you this afternoon. As we walk through this presentation, we're gonna talk about vacancies. And I want you to think about that really kind of from two perspectives. You know, The first is, you have vacancies perhaps because you're expanding. It could be you're opening a new location, adding a shift, adding a line in a manufacturing facility, or even thinking about it as a functional expansion. You may have sales expansions or project management, technology, those types of things. So there's that type of vacancy, but then there's the second type, which is the one that is the obvious one. Someone leaves your organization and you have an opening. Regardless the type of vacancy, um, 
we look at this as, as a huge opportunity for your organization. So it's my hope that when we wrap up today, that you'll have some framework that enables you to have a strategic discussion with your executives on this important investment that we believe every organization should be making. So I'm gonna share a story, which is, is really the catalyst for the topic of today's discussion. So this happened um, recently. So we had a prospect that inquired about um, our support to staff a new state-of-the-art labeling and packaging facility. Um, you know, from our perspective, from an RPO provider's perspective, this was an ideal prospect is they, they really needed strategic, strategic guidance on a new market in which they were locating and, and they didn't have any internal infrastructure to manage this work. So, you know, we invested quite a bit of time with them to understand their market and provided data and where they were positioned in the marketplace. And, and from there, of course, submitted a proposal to staff this facility. It was only then at that point <laughs> that it was, um, that it came to light as they looked internally, uh, you know, to get approval, they came back and said, ah, we have no budget to staff the plant. Um, I mean, literally, it's a, like, say what you are investing a billion dollars literally a billion dollars brand new location state-of-the-art equipment opportun this is an opportunity to hire your first 150 employees to launch this facility in a new location so and and literally identifying hiring the best talent was an afterthought in this particular case, they, they put in, in this particular example, 80 grand for a contract recruiter. So, um, you know, what, what a missed opportunity. Uh, we had some, some further discussion with them, you know, as, as the providers we are, we don't ever give up, right? Um, so after some further discussion, you know, we really get, you started to understand they didn't eat, they didn't consider the market, doing the market research that was necessary, um, even from the point of site identification. In this particular case, they were focused really on cost of living. So from, from our perspective, and, and you know, we work in this space, this is our career, right? Um, it's really critical. You've got to understand the markets in which you're recruiting. You know, what skills do you require and, and how does the market stack up as, you know, as a recruiting TA HR function, these are the, you know, as you're looking for opportunities to have a seat at the table and influence decisions that are making, these are the things that you should be bringing forth, you know, are, are is your compensation competitive in, you know, within these roles in the market? Um, who else is recruiting similar talent in the marketplace? You know, they may, you know, we oftentimes hear individuals say, well, there's nobody else in our industry in this particular market. And they're, they're limiting their view of who they're competing with. The reality is, is that who, you know, whoever is in, in the market hiring the same similar skills, you should be considering them a competitor. So um, there's, there's a lot, obviously a lot to be unpacked here. Um, and so before I turn, I'm gonna turn it over to John here, but before I do that, um, you know, I wanna call out, there is this simple, you know, many of you could do a, do a Google search or what have you of, you know, what's really the cost of vacancy? And there's this, this very simplified formula that is, is put forth. We know and well, we believe and know that it is far more complex than this. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to John, who's going to talk in a lot more detail about really the snowballing impact of, of open jobs and not only just the number of open jobs, but think about the aging of your open positions. So with that, John, I welcome you to the conversation. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that, Tam. And certainly, I think it was mentioned already, if you have any questions, uh, there goes the snowball down the hill. <laughs> uh, if you have any questions, feel free to you know, put them out there while we're talking through this at this time. So I think the challenge oftentimes is how do you quantify this? And we're not going to necessarily talk about the formulas and the actual quantification to it in that way. We're going to talk about the areas you need to be looking at, the things you need to be looking at 
that need to be considered and, and then building that uh, business case around that. It's going to really be unique to each organization. That's something we work with companies on really building out with for them and, with, and together with them. I think we all know, you know, there's a high cost of vacancies. I mean, it, it's putting not only could there be lost revenue and all that with it, but you're also putting an extra heavy load on your employees in the organization, especially if they stay open too long. Your organization's certainly going to feel the pain in many areas if you don't have a strong recruitment program in today's market. And if you're not investing enough money into that program to ensure that you're getting the hiring, having the hiring success that you need. It's a very highly competitive market today. I mean, if you're not really building out that right program, the recruitment program, you're going to be outpaced by your competition. You know, when you're not meeting your hiring needs, the workloads, as I mentioned earlier, are going to weigh on your existing employees. And that typically you're going to see the organization suffering because of that, really. You're going to see, you know, reduced and it's going to impact productivity. You're going to see employee morale being impacted by it. You're going to see efficiencies impacted by it, quality of work. There are many other invisible, I think, Pam, you mentioned this before, the invisible factors out there that impact this summer visible what's the lost revenue you kind of see on the surface what's the impact of the existing workforce and how much extra they're working and you have extra turn you have additional turnover because of that it really all adds up to a dissatisfied workforce it can lead to that which typically leads to a higher turnover we're already in a period of time they're calling the great resignation right now and you can kind of sit on both sides of that i mean if you if you don't want to add to your turnover then it's already happening out there because of that there's so much movement in jobs right now you can actually be a, you can actually benefit from that if you actually take the time now to build out a strong recruitment program and invest the dollars into that because there are a lot of people that are looking right now there's a lot of people that are moving i don't know how much longer that's going to happen but it's certainly happening out there and i think we hear about that very frequently um this ultimately while we're, we're talking now about the impact it's having on employees this is ultimately going to have an impact if it's not already having an impact on your customer satisfaction with your product or service you know, you, we're, you're talk, we're talking about unfilled positions and how that impacts turnover, how it impacts probably the internal productivity, but then it starts turning into lost revenue and potentially lost customers. There are companies that we've talked to that we've started doing work with, and, and up to that point, they were, they were actually losing some customers because they weren't actually staffed appropriately. They didn't have enough individuals working and other parts where they didn't have the quality of uh, the workforce they needed as well. So on the surface, Pam mentioned before, the, the companies can invest a lot in their facilities and their machinery and equipment and everything else, but then they're not taking, making the investment. What most every company you talk to, you're going to ask them, what's the most important your, part of your company? They're going to say they're people, but there's always that gap there. And I think it's changing. And I think this period of time is kind of forcing that change. I think in the current environment today, it's forcing companies to refocus and decide who they want to be in the employment marketplace. And I think it's something where you know, what did you, I think it's a time to look at what is your culture? What do you want, what do you want to be known for in the marketplace right now? Are you an employer of choice in the marketplace today? And if you're not an employer of choice, being realistic about it, and how do you have those conversations with your hiring managers and say, you know, based on where we sit in the marketplace today, we really are going after the B and C camps. Nobody likes to acknowledge that, but sometimes that's the reality. And how do you educate them with market research and timely information from the employment marketplace and, and other uh, information that can be provided them to as well to educate them on that. So there are all these different factors. There's a very complex and challenging marketplace today. I think Pam mentioned earlier, and we talked about this, you know, it's one thing to invest in facilities. And Pam gave you one example. There are other examples we can give you as well, where they've actually spent a lot of money, but then they haven't really put the money into bringing the people into the organization as well. I guess the one thing I would kind of sum up with this would just say, you know, don't let the snowball, I know we gave you a snowball going down the hill here, but, but, you know, in the real world today, I mean, don't let that snowball of heavy workloads, low employee morale, and high turnover gain so much momentum that it's hard to reverse that. I mean, it really could get out of control. And I, see, I think we're seeing a lot of companies that are finding themselves really just understaffed. And it's not, it's almost like it's, it's this vicious cycle there. The more understaffed you are, the more workload it puts on your employees. And then you just become more understaffed. And, and plus, then your brand gets out there and social media just, you know, everything travels so quickly out there as well. So there's a lot of things that are impacting companies right now from a turnover standpoint, and I'm, I don't think it's going to get any better. I think it's really very important for companies to actually take steps now to actually address that and really prepare for the future. And, and I'll add to that in that what the, if, if this is happening within your organization, or we've seen it with, with some um, organizations that we worked with in that they, they found themselves on their heels, right? And they're reacting you know, from a, from a TA perspective. And so, 
you know, therefore their, their HR team is not able to be pro, you know, really proactively working on the programming that's necessary. So, um, you know, one of the, one of the points and, and John touched on this briefly, but it, you know, high turnover impacts your ability to have a successful succession planning program. And, um, you know, it is, it's so important. You see the statistic there, you know, 86% of leaders believe it's important, but 14, only 14% feel they're doing it well. And um, I mean, that's, that's a pretty staggering statistic. And, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that um, you, you know, when you have turnover in your organization, it, it's hard to be, it's hard to be proactive. It's, it's that simple. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Pam. So where do you start? Yes, you know, prioritize challenges and create a clear, clear path forward. I think really you have to determine, you know, what are the challenges that your organization faces to having a successful recruitment program? Is it your budget? Uh, we talked about that already a few times here. I mean, is it, do you have enough of a budget to actually have an impact, to have a positive impact from that standpoint? Is it your employment brand in the market? I mean, do you, do you have the right brand in the market? Does it represent your organization? Is it right for your company? Do you even have a brand in the market? Compensation, are you competitive in the market? There are compensation, you know, I won't name names here, but there are organizations out there that provide that information to organizations that they make compensation decisions with. And it's moving so quickly right now, you almost need real-time information for that as well. Do you have that information? Do you have the information you need to be competitive? It's not always about compensation. It could be your culture, growth opportunities, workloads, really depending, determining what is that brand your organization? What is your value proposition? What sets you apart? What, what's your differentiator in the market today? And then high turnover. Why do you have that high turnover if you have turnover? Or even if you don't have high turnover, why do you have turnover? Do you do uh, exit interviews, do you gather that information? Do you make changes to anything from a recruiting standpoint that could impact that in a positive way? And I think there's also in the markets moving so quickly, the employment market, I find that hiring managers, they know their jobs. They're great at what they do. They don't always know the employment market out there. They just don't have information that educates them about it as well. Are they making adjustments? Or is it, is it, are they providing clarity around the roles they're looking for? So often I'm finding hiring managers are looking for two or three individuals in the same role, you know, and not really prioritizing one of the important parts of that role, yet they're looking for it in one, one role. And then what ends up happening is the position just stays open for months and months and months. And that's, that can be a challenge. But I think for hiring managers, I guess, in defense of them, do they have the information? Do they have up-to-date information about the market to actually make those type of decisions? And I think it's really tackling each of those challenges as they come, you know, not putting just a Band-Aid on it. Are you building a long-term solution to meet the company's hiring needs today and the future? Are you sometimes just Make it taking an easy fix, putting it in place, which ends up sometimes compounding and making a bigger problem down the road. Do you have a tactical recruitment program in place or do you have a strategic re recruitment program in place? Are you putting out fires every day? That's not fun for anybody. So it's like, how do you get ahead of that? And I think some of the things we're talking about today is really trying to help companies position themselves to be ahead of that and be more strategic in how they're approaching that. The other thing I would say is that is your recruitment program and the strategy for that program in a position to really handle the inevitable changes that are happening in today's hiring market? You know, if you actually are able to put in place a high performing recruitment program, and I've heard this from many clients that we have, this is the change they've seen happen. It gives time back to their team, especially their leadership team. And it's just surprising to them how much time they can spend on putting fires out or just dealing with some very tactical issues when it comes to recruitment and they find themselves tied up on that day in and day out. And what it does is it allows you to actually focus more on your strategic HR initiatives like diversity, equity, and inclusion, employment engagement, succession planning. And likewise, to we show that snowball rolling down the hill kind of in a negative kind of way, the negative impacts in a positive way. If you put these programs in place, you can actually start to build that up in a positive way. Your company can actually start taking all these um, initiatives and the improvements that you're putting in place and really build upon those to really build a very successful organization if you can focus on those things that are going to make the organization better uh, from how recruitment can support that. So, yeah, yeah in, once you take in, the lemonade. In, <laughs> I mean, in today's market, you, you know, we, we talk, we've mentioned employment brand. That is, that should really be front and center. Um, you know, John, 
made the comment about social media and and the impact that it has on every one of our organizations every day. But the you know the reality is from a you know even from a customer perspective as well as from your candidate perspective, they're they're researching and and understanding what it's like. And and to John's point, um, we feel there's huge value in 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 addressing and addressing TA, making it productive so that your HR teams can really be, they can be building that snowball to build your employment brand and really make a huge, that, that makes a huge splash. It, it, it really, it cannot be, in my opinion, underestimated. So, um, so you're looking at this delicious glass of lemonade. So, um, you know, we do truly feel that with the right RPO partner, you can, you too can make lemonade when you're, when you're handed lemons um, within your organization. So, you know, really how, you know, this, the slide is to just really reinforce how does an RPO partner help enable this transformation? Um, because what we've talked about is kind of this um, reality of, you know, uh, like a high number of vacant, high number of open jobs, they're aging and so on, and, and shifting to this proactive, you know, positioning your organization, your HR and TA organizations to be strategic and, and proactive. Um, you know, we feel a, the best place to start is identifying an RPO partner to do that. Um, you know, a strategic partnership with an RPO provider really enables the HR team to develop and execute on programming that will truly transform your organization. You know, an RPO partner prioritizes and elevates talent acquisition. Um, we're we, we are the RPO provider, right? We're experts in this space. This is what, what our teams, I don't do it every day, but my teams do. Um, you know, we bring thought leadership through our experience. We're, we're supporting so many different customers on a day-to-day -day -day basis. And, and we, learn, we learn different things from each customer, which is typically in different industries and so on. Um, you know, an RPO partner develops and executes efficient processes that ultimately deliver the best talent to your organization at a time when the market is, it's tough to do that. Any, you, you can't talk to a recruiter out there that doesn't, wouldn't agree that, that it's a really challenging time. Um, we deliver real-time market data that really gives your executive teams insights and transparency into what's happening to make day-to-day -day decisions and, and ultimately giving you, giving you control. You know, many buyers, Think of, they, they worry that um, partnering with an outsource provider is you're losing control. I truly believe that we give you the tools to take full control over what's happening. All of this while, you know, while improving your time to fill, which is kind of the foundation of what we're talking about today, which then reduces your risk of increased costs due to aging vacancies. So, you know, just in a quick summary, and if, if there are questions, we certainly can take those. Um, but so as we think about, sorry, I'm trying to decide if I needed to click to make those um, proceed. So, um, so as you think about building a business case for, for your executives or for your, for your team, whatever, um, you know, first I would say really, understand what is being impacted. We talked about probably seven or eight different things that, you know, vacancies could impact. Is it, are you losing revenue? Are you losing market share? Is your employee engagement being impacted, which is driving in turnover, which could impact quality of work and so on. So what is it? I think, you know, only you know that within your organization. So I, you know, prioritize your top three and, and then work with your leadership team to quantify the real dollar impact this is having on your business. When you actually start to go through this exercise, the um, enormity of the dollars is, it can be overwhelming, but, but ultimately that's then your business case to make change within the organization, which is then, you know, creating the plan to drive measurable improvement. And, um, you know, 
we were conscious about putting that measurable word in there because it is really important that you're leveraging data that you're taking the time to go find you know go access data and then analyze it and leverage it um as i said it is it's a bit startling how quickly these numbers add up and um quite honestly how quickly you can build a case to say we really need to make an investment here in order to to start to transform us into this more what i would think is a more productive environment in which you want to work um with that were there any um were there any questions that came in while we were yeah, and pam one other quick thing i was just thinking of here it's like you know business leaders leaders make decisions based on data and information a lot of times and it's interesting i mean we talk about building this business case and even using examples of putting up facilities up and it's almost like talent the recruitment and the talent was an afterthought of that really and i think it's it's interesting because i know it's always have a seat at the table it's almost like having the right seat at the right table at the right time and and getting there through building out business cases around this i think that's where we start to look at this and i think pam said sometimes it's a like the cost sometimes the savings or the cost are really pretty big and that's something that's going to get readers attention but it's not always positioned and, and presented in that way so i think that's i think that's a really important thing to be looking at with that i know there's a question there as well let me um, yeah, John, I'm not sure if you are able to see the uh, Q&A panel Yes, yeah, I, I can read it if you'd like. Yes, without violating any antitrust areas, I've run to different price, run into different pricing approaches. How is RPO priced if you have three to 25 positions open at any given time? Um, it, it, it's hard, like, it's hard to say, uh, you know, it, I think there are, you know, from from our perspective, first and foremost, it's we would we would seek to better understand what are you trying to accomplish as an organization and how how might the partnership be structured in order to help you accomplish those goals. Um, and, and once we understand that, we could then put a pricing model in place. So it, this is an opportunity. I, I you know, I don't want to pontificate, but this is what we run into on a on a, a pretty frequent basis is a, like a hey i've got these 20 openings how 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 much would it cost for you to fix, kind of fix them right um you know an rpo partnership is is really strategic to the organization and is one that is it does require a lot of um kind of seek to understand each other both us understanding you as a client and you understanding us and our culture as an rpo partner um, because we we are operating as you out in the marketplace, and therefore there has to be a lot of synergies. Um, so, in, you know, I know that was super vague and um, probably didn't truly answer the question, but but it's just it's difficult without having really you know deep conversations. As I said, we're here to we're here to move and elevate your TA function. Um, and, and that that goes beyond just simply number of openings. Yeah, I think the other thing I would just add to that, Pam, would be, you know, we the way we build these out with our clients from that from a pricing standpoint is we do build it on results. I mean, we're very results oriented in how we build out the pricing and how we um, do the work with our cu customers around that. And I think that's I'd like to I mean, I'd like to think there are other things that play in this as well. But I think when we talked about our net promoter score, we talked about the feedback and the surveys and the high scores we get back from customers and even our candidates, even the candidates through the pipeline, we get high scores on that as well and hiring managers. I do think it's because we align our pricing to results on our end. So we're basically partnered with you. <laughs> we're not just like, okay, you pay us whether we fill the jobs or not. You know, we are aligned with you um, to make sure we're, we have to be we, you, we have to be successful for you before we're gonna be successful as well. And that's really how we build out our pricing models. I, I do want to allow other uh, participants as well to ask questions, but I'm going to do a quick quiz here and, and share some uh, very fresh recent data we just got from our uh, friend Ben Eubanks at Lighthouse Research and Advisory. So they recently, just uh, this month, they did a TA priorities study data. And um, my question to you for Pam and John, as well as the audience, I, I wanna see guesses as well from our uh, audience. What is the number one thing RPO buyers say is valuable for them in the relationship? Um, 
wow, this is just a pure <laughs> guess, right? Um, yeah. And I, I think it's, it's, and I'm sure they didn't use this language, right? But um, the confidence that that TA is being handled so that they can focus on all those strategic things that, um, you know, they, that need their attention within the organization. Yeah. John, do you have a guess? Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't, I, a lot of times I don't even think they, they recognize, but I don't think they feel the true impact of it until they start work with an RPO and really realize how much time they are spending on recruitment and those type of things, which to them, I mean, their area of tech expertise is usually typically HR. I think that's what you're referencing, Pam, right? And really, I think that's something they're able to really become much more strategic. I think some of these things we're talking about, you know, having a seat at the table, you know, putting the business case together, um, you know, how do you make sure you're putting a facility up and you make sure you have the talent acquisition solution in place there? What's the strategy around that? And what are you going to do to execute on that? I think a lot of it at times is sometimes they just don't have the time to do that. I mean, they're just running and putting fires out every day, which I think I've just found so many times that it just elevates HR to a much more strategic level within the organization. And that's just where their minds, they're able to start thinking at that level as well. You know how it is, you're up and down, up and down, tactically one hour or two, then back up again. So that's, I think that's a big, that's something I see really a lot where the big difference. Well, I'm, I'm very impressed. You guys are very close. So the number one RPO buyer's value in that relationship is bringing innovative ideas to solve mm -hmm. their business problems. Mm -hmm. It is scored more highly than service, technology expertise, business alignment, or industry specific expertise, mm -hmm. which is yeah. all the stuff that you guys mm -hmm. touch mm -hmm. on today. Which, you know, which does resonate in that when you think about the reality of our day-to-day -day for our account teams is that, you know, they're constantly innovating to ensure that, you know, because we're, we're, we're experiencing, you know, a different reality every day and, and we're solving for it, you know, with our customers. Yeah, I, that's probably even more important today, I think, Pam, what you just mentioned, because there are things like within sourcing and mm -hmm. how to attract candidates and the brand. I mean, there's so many things today, social media, there's so much more complexity to it that, you know, we have a department that just does that, but most organizations do not have that opportunity. So how do you stay on top of that? But it's just constantly changing. And some of the things are changing almost weekly as well. I mean, as far as how we have to make adjustments for that. So it's, it's, uh, it's kind of fun. I mean, there's a lot of change and challenges that come with that, but, uh, but certainly I understand where companies are really in a tough position. They just don't have that support to do that a lot of times. And yet the expectations from their leadership and hiring managers are still there to keep performing, even though the market's so challenging and tough, but yet they don't have the support to do that a lot of times. Very good. So we'll take a couple of questions. You guys want to take questions before sure, we wrap sure. up? If there uh, are questions. All right. So um, I think there's one that just came up. Another one here. Sean, you want to you wanna uh, just that? join and have to head out. <laughs> <laughs> They're asking if it would be recorded in email. So yeah. Yeah. All right. I'll yeah. take that then. <laughs> and and I will. I'll, I'll also add. You know, John and I, we live this, love it, right, every day. So our contact information is here. Feel free to reach out if you want to spend. You know, we'll give you a whatever amount of time that yeah. you need if you if you're working on this with your business and and want to pick our brains and get you know get some insights in terms of how to actually actually do this um, build a business case and so on don't hesitate to reach out we're happy to spend time with you and um because this is really important and and um you know we're very very committed to, to helping ensure that organizations are able to attract the talent they deserve very good so let's take uh, one other question and the question is regarding your story about significantly and their budgeting for ta for a new <laughs> facility, which is probably not very unusual. Uh, how can HR better bridge the gap between the current labor market challenges and how companies think they can solve them? It's up to you, honey. I can take it. I, ahead, I, John. I, I think um, it's really, I think, I think it's all about the business case, right? Building that, but it is, it is information not anecdotal information, like just information, hard data from, you know, market research and information out there really to educate internally together with, you know, what the cost savings or, or revenue lost or whatever it might be, I think is important because I think just to, we can sit here and all think, you know, it's changing, 
and we need to make these changes, but internally in the organizations, they don't understand. I mean, they're doing their jobs day in and day out. So I think it's really a lot of educating them in the marketplace, how it's changed. Um, and just, I think it's really going down that path with mm -hmm. them. It's almost, and I think about quantifying the cost of not addressing it, right? Yeah. Um, and and it, it just, I, I, there was a point in my career a few years ago, we were, to, we were talking about succession planning in our organization and, and our, our CHRO, I forget the exact question I asked, and um, she just, and it was about succession, succession planning and, and like what, you know, I, I don't know what my question was, but she responded like, you can't, you can't afford not to, right? It was almost, you know, and it was one of those responses to me that like hit me right between the eyes of like, hey, that was really foolish of me. But I see this as similar. It's like you, you almost can't afford to not address it. Um, but you have to be able to do that using data around what's happening in the market and all those things that we talked about today. Oh, very good. So um, one other question, and it's something we've been talking about um, in terms of the rec uh, recruitment, marketing, and employer branding. We've been talking about uh, these aspects of recruitment in the last few years uh, here at the RPO Association and the importance, significance of that. Uh, so a question is the our executives can't quite grasp the importance of a strong, positive employer brand and how that ties to business success. <laughs> so like I said, that's a big topic, but um, Pam and John, how do you help clients message this internally? If you wanna to touch on that briefly. I would say first go to your glass, go show them your glass door reviews, right? Um, you know, we touched on social media, go, go to go to Facebook, go to, you know, any any social media outlet, right? That is tied to your organization and 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 start to really peel back what what feedback you're getting because that is, you know, that is your employer brand. Um, you know, I think we all do a lot of work within our organizations to say, this is our brand, right? We all have the elevator spiel of, you know, this is who we are in the market and so on. But what you need to do is really understand what the perception is of both your employees, ex-employees, your customers, and so on. Um, and I think it becomes clear very quickly how important it is. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with all that, Pam. I mean, I think it's, it's interesting because I, I think there are companies out there who are very successful that put a lot of money into building out their employment brand and, and making sure it's out there the way they want it to be. And I think that, you know, companies around marketing, the marketing brand, in the organization as well. And then also, is that even aligned to your employment brand? Because there are sometimes buyer, I mean, not only just from the employees, like hiring individuals in the organization, but companies out there see what your employment brand is. Potential customers see that as well, um, especially in some industries more than others. I mean, you have an industry that's really consumer based and you know, selling to thousands and millions of people out there, they, a lot of them see what your employment brand is as well. So it's not even just how it impacts um, hiring as well. But I think certainly there are a lot of things that we could, you know, talk to companies about around that, the importance of that and why it makes a huge difference. All right. Well, thank you both, uh, Pam and John. Uh, for the sake of our audience, our webinars, we try to keep them brief and informative. We do try to keep to 30 minutes, and we have a lot to talk about. Very um, informative, again, from Pam and John. So I do want to wrap today's webinar. Um, and uh, Pam, if you don't mind, uh, Pam and John's information are on the screen you will receive the webinar recording by tomorrow along with advanced RPO's co contact information. Um, and definitely we encourage you to have conversation with the team uh, if you have the need. I do like to have the screen over, Pam, screen sharing. Okay, very good. So I do wanna uh, share a couple of announcements from the RPOA. All right. And going. 
starting over here. So I know we have a mixed audience uh, of some returning participants, but also some newer ones. I do want to take the time, uh, take a minute to introduce the RPOA. Uh, the Recruitment Process Outsourcing Association is a member driven and mission driven organization serving the global RPO ecosystem and striving to be the place to go for RPO. Our mission is to nurture a collaborative community where thought leadership can be created and curated to educate the marketplace about RPO. As an organization, the RPOA serves the global RPO community. This includes anyone in talent acquisition interested in RPO. So it's a mix of RPO buyers, providers, as, as well as consultants, uh, technology providers, and so forth. We produce quality content in collaboration with cor corporate members and sponsors like Advanced RPO, today's um, um, guest. And our content is focused on talent acquisition trends and best practices for the RPO community. We host two active blogs, produce a monthly newsletter, offer many free resources and webinars. First, the RPO Leadership Forum is a monthly webinar series scheduled for the third Tuesday of each month. Uh, these are 30-minute webinars, like I said, uh, presented by RPOA members on educational RPO-related content and target RPO buyers and or providers. Today's webinar is part of the RPO Leadership Forum series. Next month, we are pleased to welcome back Mike Brand with Broadleaf Results to talk about another RPO topic, Navigating RPO. You can find upcoming events on our RPOA website under the Events tab. You can access webinar recordings and other content through the RPO Academy on the website. This month, in honor of Women History Month, the RPOA celebrated 52 women in RPO who were recognized by their peers for the contributions they are making for their organization. The initiative was launched in 2021 in light of the social justice movement and the increased awareness of diversity and inclusion in the workplace. Last month, the RPOA launched a new initiative initiative aimed at fostering mutually beneficial partnerships within the recruitment outsourcing community, which we call iCoco for innovative community connections. You can learn about all these programs and find how you can get involved on uh, the RPO Association website. With that, I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. Please stay connected, stay engaged, and stay informed of what's happening in the talent and RPO world by tuning into the RPOA, the place to go for RPO. Thank you again for our wonderful speakers, Pam and John. Always a pleasure to have you. Appreciate the opportunity. Well, thank you. And thank Absolutely. you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank Take you care. all for joining us. Have a great day and Bye -bye. hope to see you soon. Thank you.